Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've had a chance to have some tea and some nice snacks out there because we're continuing straight through with our programming. After that fantastic panel on corruption, you know, we thought this is a really important national security issue, corruption that doesn't always get a lot of attention, so we wanted to highlight it here. We now have a special treat for you. Uh, Senator Jack Reed is with us, Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, member of the Appropriations Committee, a very busy man. And here to interview him, of course, we have Gordon Lubald, who's both a White House and national security reporter of the Wall Street Journal. Will you join me up here, please? Thank you. And You know, we've heard a lot this morning. We heard from uh, Chairman Milley, we heard from Condi Rice, we heard from many others about defense modernization. You know, the idea that we need to actually retire legacy systems and start fighting the wars of the 21st century, and there's no one who's been in the forefront of that more than Senator Reid. You've talked about it, you're doing the hard work behind the scenes in the Senate and both armed services and appropriations, so we really look forward to hearing from you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board. Senator Reid, please go ahead. You have the floor. Well, uh, we're at a critical moment in terms, as has been described, of uh, transitioning our military. And one of the major parts of that transition is the way we go ahead and acquire equipment, maintain equipment, keep it. We're still, frankly, uh, in the industrial age. When uh, Secretary McNamara came to, in 1961, uh, his model was probably the most sophisticated one around, and Ford Motor Company was doing very well, but today it's post-industrial. It's technology, it's uh, rapidity, it's, uh, it's developing prototypes quickly, testing the prototypes. So we're trying to get our Department of Defense to update their approach. Uh, you've all heard of the of famous Valley of Death in which uh, projects languish for two years, and then at the end of the two years, they just run out of speed. So we've made changes, and in fact, in this National Defense Authorization Act, we have additional changes to try to expedite. Some of the things we've done is to give uh, more flexibility to the services to, to buy equipment and deploy equipment, uh, and we're gonna try to, to do that even more. So that's one area, but I think the other area we wanna talk about is China. So I will yield to the expert. <coughs> yeah. Um, you know about that. Um, great to be here. Thanks for everybody coming and tuning in. Um, I appreciate, uh, Senator Reed, uh, you coming. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of time, so I think I'll probably just jump in. I want to talk different things, but um, uh, General Milley earlier was uh, asked about the, the budget and, and the CR. Right. And this is, you know, right in your wheelhouse. <coughs> I think if we talk about China um, and we talk about the need to compete and to confront whatever the verb is, um, uh, many would say if uh, Congress can't pass a budget, how do you possibly compete? Um, you know, uh, and I was talking to somebody earlier, you know, a, a few months delay during a CR, six or eight months or whatever, translates to much more uh, delay that you're never going to get back. So how do you fix that? Well, uh, we started out uh, in July on the Armed Services Committee and working closely with uh, Senator Inhofe, uh, we passed an uh, NDA bill which raised the President's proposal by about $25 billion. So we knew we had to put robust funding in. And one of the reasons is the emerging threats of China, but also the ancillary threats across the globe in many other areas. Uh, and our colleagues in the House uh, not only passed it in committee, passed it on the floor over objections. Uh, and our appropriators uh, in the Senate posted the bill with our numbers in there. What we've gone ground down to, though, is this 50-50 Senate stalemate as to, you know, are we going to get a real budget? And I should point out, and, and, and I'm sure General Milley did this, a CR, it, it really uh, undercuts the Department of Defense. It paralyzes many things they can do. Uh, it's hard for them to enter into contracts. It's, it just basically puts them on hold for a while. And it, our 
adversaries or our competitors look at this and say, well, that's d dysfunctional, yay, <laughs> no applaud. So we've got to get it done. And it's a matter of, uh, you know, getting our colleagues on both sides of the aisle to sit down and hammer it out. December 3rd is the tentative deadline, I believe. And so we've got to get it done by then. But the point I would make to my Republican colleagues is that it would be a serious blow to the Department of Defense to have to withstand one, two, three, four months of uh, Is there something CR. that people can glom on to that, uh, that sticks out in your mind as uh, particularly vulnerable when it comes to managing government this way? I mean, uh, is there a program in particular that you could point to or something that you would point to that, that makes people understand? And, and also, like, although there's not a lot of consensus about a lot of things, there does seem to be some consensus on confronting China. Well, and absolutely. So, and, you know, you, you could look at all the things we're proposing in NDAA, uh, which would require additional funding over the CR level. The Pacific Defense Initiative, I think for Admiral Aquilino, we've uh, authorized, uh, I think, up to $700 million for projects focused on joint training, collaboration, uh, some uh, uh, communications issues that they have to sort out, and that would be foregone. Uh, and then just the day-to-day the, the -day military construction, uh, it hard, it's hard to build new projects when you're at last year's level. And one other issue which is affecting the Department of Defense is the uh, price of gasoline. Uh, we lo use a lot of gasoline, and that has to be absorbed in the budget. And if you are essentially flat from last year, that's an additional significant cost. So you could have a long, long list of, of dysfunctional aspects of a CR. You touch on PDI. Um, people probably know the Pacific uh, Deterrence Initiative. Um, I think there was a placeholder, some money last year in it, but then it got serious this year. Of course, the budget's not passed, but um, why, uh, why is the PDI important to you? And it, does it have a future given the broader no, I, I think it has a, a, a necessary future. Uh, it is, in some respects, modeled on the European Defense Initiative, which was passed in the wake of the Crimean incident. Uh, and both Senator Inhofe and I, looking at the situation, said we've got to refocus on, on China and the Pacific, and we've got to do that not just by buying different equipment. We have to get a joint effort, and the jointness begins within the U.S. services, and a strategy, operational strategy, that will be effective in the Pacific, where there are distances and there's logistical issues, et cetera. And we haven't been spending the time working on those. We've right. been preoccupied with counterinsurgency warfare for 20 years. And then we want to bring in our allies, because we know uh, that whatever power we bring to bear must be magnified by allies who are with us because the uh, China and everyone else can count how many submarines you have deployed and if there are two times as many as the U.S. has, that's good. Right, right, right. Yeah. So we're, we're forcing that issue. I, we, I'll come back and ask you about August, but um, some of us uh, are fresh off reporting from Bang On's new uh, China military uh, report, the power report um, hmm. that was released today. Um, which had a number of uh, facts, uh, a number of uh, factors in it that were interesting, including a more uh, accelerated uh, uh, effort to get a nuclear arsenal, That's 1, right. thousand warheads by 2030, yeah. Yeah. this kind of thing, and also uh, a little more pronounced uh, feeling of concern about uh, a, a forced reunification of Taiwan, the unification of mm -hmm. Taiwan. Um, what do you think, uh, as you know, the overseer of, I mean, the oversight uh, guy? Mm -hmm. What do you think that the, uh, you can do to help um, force the Pentagon to do what it needs to do in Taiwan in particular, and to counter that kind of rising threat? Well, I, I think one first is it's in, uh, encouraging, as we did in the PD, uh, Defense Initiative, this uh, thoughtful. Uh, attempt approach to be joint, to be able to communicate 
One of the, the key issues is communication because the Chinese are very sophisticated with cyber interruption and other things. When I was an infantry lieutenant a long time ago, the mantra was shoot, move, communicate. Today it's communicate so you can shoot and move. So we have to have very strong cyber systems uh, which spans not just terrestrial but also space, so space force has to be involved. Uh, then we want to go ahead and exercise these uh, uh, concepts. It's one thing to talk about getting the platforms out there and having everyone ready to go, but if you haven't you know, practiced literally, you're not going to be able to, to withstand. And that's the emphasis we're pushing. So it's a combination of uh, bringing our allies together uh, with uh, the same jointness that we can propagate with our own force. It was encouraging that the president, for the first time, brought the Quad together in the White House. Right. And uh, there was a commitment, and it wasn't just to, you know, in China, it was about how we can work together on cyber, how we can work together on AI, how we can reinforce values, you know, for the free transit of the ocean, sovereignty of states without fearing. And that, I think, is a concept that's going to be able to be developed robustly. Is there more the U.S., kind of more broadly, I mean, is there more the U.S. needs to do to persuade allies, friends, allies um, in the region and beyond to come along with the U.S. And we saw Australia, which has long been a hedger when it comes mm -hmm. to China, mm -hmm. like, you know, make a kind of more full-throated um, uh, alignment with the U.S. with the sub deal. Um, uh, is there more that should be done that you're wishing? Well, I think there is more that we, we could be doing, and we're beginning to do that. Uh, the EU has adopted some very positive language about the interest in the uh, Pacific area. Um, the, as I mentioned, the Quad, I think, is a, the, f the first primary building block for this international coalition. Again, and it's not just, I, it's not, we hope, against something, it's for something, right. and for something positive that will benefit everyone. Uh, and that, I think, is, is sort of the, the direction where we have to go and we must go. Um, uh, when it comes to some of uh, doing some of this with friends, allies, partners, um, foreign military sales, which does not fall under your right. um, scope, uh, but is a primary thing and uh, is a primary you know, tool that the U.S. can use. Um, from where you sit, which is not in that wheelhouse, um, what could be done to compress that, make it more efficient, make it more effective and more relevant when the U.S. is like needing to expand to, its group? To, to expand its influence, et cetera. Well, I think it goes hand in hand with some of the concepts that are being developed now with our forces, uh, not just the naval forces, but Marines and even Army, where uh, it's not a, a strategy based on formal bases, it's based on presence throughout the area. That presence has several beneficial concepts. One, it shows we're interested. Two, it helps us mentor local forces. And in conjunction with that, it will help us train them on equipment that we could supply. Sure. And I think uh, we could expedite uh, the procedures. I don't think they need a radical change in the, the procedures. We can expedite it so that we can deliver equipment to uh, countries that are very much would like to be with us. But as, without the training, without the presence, the equipment alone sometimes is an expensive investment for the country. <laughs> we, I think we've seen some recent examples of the potential that uh, the vacuum left by U.S.'s decision, and I know, I, I know this is not your world, but it affects your world, you know, on, on, on some arms sales or whatever, uh, the vacuum leaves an out opening for China in particular, yeah. others to come in. And uh, that's an ongoing threat, but I mean, uh, I don't know if there's something that can be No, I, I mean, I think there's some, you know, we have some very positive developments. We talked about the Quad, but we also should recognize we just reestablished relationships with the Philippines. Right. We're back where we were at the beginning of the Duarte term. Right. Um, and we've also settled our uh, special measures with Korea. So we've now have a stable, and it wasn't a, 
an argument back and forth between landlord and tenant. It was a very principled negotiation. So we, we've reestablishing a presence there. Now we can complement that presence with real training in the Philippines, for example, equipment that they may need. Uh, and all of that is just these building blocks of uh, jointness and collaboration with our uh, colleagues, you know, friendly countries. In the Got country. it. Um, uh, another area related um, is uh, one that I think you think a lot about, which is uh, innovation, mm -hmm. or the lack thereof, and the speed at which uh, the yeah. Pentagon yeah. can move. Um, we've seen some efforts, DIU, X, I always thought they should have kept the X, yeah. DIU, mm -hmm. um, uh, Army Fort, uh, Futures Command. What do you see in there? What do you want to see there? Well, I, I mean, uh, again, there's been some positive steps. Uh, we've got a long way to go. Uh, one is uh, out at Army Futures Command. Uh, you know, I've been out there to visit. General Murray has done an excellent job. And they're looking at getting prototypes out to the troops for evaluation very quickly, which is, I think, a, a, an essential step in speeding up the process. Uh, and DUI has, has been something that uh, has been very valuable in terms of particularly some of our cyber endeavors. And we have to do more of that. I think also, too, we have to uh, recognize that we need to simplify the process. We need also to be able to reach out to small innovative companies and do it in a way that they um, you feel comfortable working with us. You know, we have SBIR projects and grants, but usually that, that leads down to a, a product, but then the adoption of the product by the service is not automatic. Right. I, you know, the sooner I think the, we get the uh, users in the process, right. and the ultimate users, the better off we'll be. And we're trying to work through uh, this very complicated, uh, you know, it's over decades, there's been like an atoll accretion of different rules and regulations and interpretations. We're trying to get through that. And then the other fact, honestly, is we need uh, highly skilled both military personnel in acquisitions and civilian personnel. And, uh, and we need, those ranks have been depleted a bit. We have been squeezing uh, over the last several years, course savings, other reasons some of our acquisition personnel. We need them better trained and also better Trained, equipped. but maybe inculcated with a new mindset. I think when no, Army absolutely. Futures Command was created, uh, it, it, some would have, some did argue that it was great window dressing, but that the Army bureaucracy, the procurement bureaucracy was still in the way. And they, you know, people who were in positions of power could not Change. No, I, it, this is not a you see any task. progress. Uh, well, I mean, we're trying to give them the legislative leverage to, to, to make those moves. Uh, and, you know, I think the other, again, I can't stress enough, I, I think what we, what we want to do is go out and get these prototypes in the hands of personnel in exercises right. to see if they work and to get the comments from a spec four when i come in with a company the spec four is no more than anybody else cool. i have tell them like this doesn't work i don't like this right and then you can ditch this. it and move on and find it yeah one that works. and you know that's easy to say very hard to do with a you know a, a regime which for you know since 1961 has been ppe uh, ppbe i should say right. and it's been you know it's cultural it's hard to get around the uh, culture. Um, but I think uh, the, I'm encouraged by the, the direction that Secretary Austin wants to take. I think Kath Hicks, the Deputy Secretary, has got a really good hand on trying to shake this, this system up. And we want to be supportive. Um, but you know, the, there's some examples, for example, uh, recently, the Navy shipbuilding program. Back in the Clinton administration, uh, the yards didn't have a lot of ships to build, so they said, "Let's do the. We'll do the planning and the design, et cetera, which was previously generally a nav C, and nav C is diminished, and the contractors now have all this, and we're seeing a lot of systems uh, that are very expensive, 
and you know we ordered I think we were ordering f originally 52 LCSs and uh, now we're down to a handful and we're going to retire one this year right. which is a, uh, probably a, a very it has more useful life so we have to start thinking too have we become too over aligned on the contract I think that another problem we have in this area is that we've seen the contractor base shrink through mergers acquisitions and it's you know it's almost like there's one person to do this and take it or leave it so you mean too few I mean too few too yeah few I, I mean I, again I think you know we've I was constant consolidation so that there's just a few people that uh, there are two entities that build submarines uh, there's a, a there are specialized entities that will build fighter aircraft, but they, you know, there's others that will build bombers, and we're losing, I think, some of the uh, dexterity we had in previous years, uh, just being able to go out and, and and make these systems more economic to the government, and uh, and allow for more innovation, having good ideas coming out. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, we should come back to that. I think we have a few minutes, not even. Um, and we have, a f in two minutes, I'm gonna ask one more question I would love to ask, but in two minutes I'd like to go to the audience and then we'll have five minutes for answers. So I'm gonna try to do a, kind of a quick round and then see if the center can uh, indulge us and answer some of the audience's questions, which are probably better than mine. Um, but I do have one last one on uh, the um, global posture review. This is the wonkiest conversation. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, this uh, is this looming document that's right. a review of a realignment of forces and capabilities around the um, uh, world for the U.S. military. Um, it's already kind of seen as it's going to be a snoozer. It's going to be a nothing burger. Nothing's going to really come out of it at a time when people say we're at a strategic crossroads we need to have revolutionary ideas we need to like mm -hmm. move out realign forces move them here do this so, uh, what i don't know if you know anything about early reads of what it may or may not say but do you agree with that and if so then what can you do to kind of juice the system to think well i mean i think it, you know the handwriting on the wall is the, the the pacing threat will be china but then we have to be very very serious about not focusing exclusively on china we have this habit of getting preoccupied by an issue for the last 20 years it's been the the war against terrorism to the neglect of other issues and in that time china has risen up russia has re built its forces and become much more i think uh, uh technically uh, um, capable yeah. and so we have to keep doing that we also have to recognize uh, that it's not just the military it's also diplomatic presence and we have to be able to to think in terms of the pacific of different operational modes that did not really uh, you know did not jump up when you were talking about a potential fight in Europe, just distance. So no, I think it will be. We're trying to get them, and I think they feel conscientious enough to, to you know, put in a real effort here. Integration of space, which you know, uh, was not as, as critical as it is today. Cyber, uh, I, I, frankly, uh, uh, <laughs> Any sort of engagement is going to begin with a significant cyber attack. That's I sure. bet a lot of money on that. Autonomous vehicles. How do we how do we go ahead and get away from uh, you know manned vehicles and get to more autonomous? It goes back to the, the, the line that uh, attribution is is questionable, but it's don't send a soldier where you can send a bullet. Well, right. don't send a manned vessel when you can send an autonomous vessel. So all of these factors that have to be incorporated in this new design. And it, you know, and, and one would hope that at least in the overall architecture, there is an attempt to, uh, you know, go after some sacred cows. Uh, we're not very good at that in Congress. We, no. yeah, we, we're, we're, we're good at hurting, but we're not good at other means of going that. But I think that's that's could be called for. And just real quick, do you agree with the idea of pulling forces out of places like Africa, uh, uh, other parts of the uh, region, particularly Africa and the Middle East, in order to kind of some, what 
some would say is a simplistic focus on uh, confront China in the indo pacom at the other regions. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there'll be some movement of forces, but I think the first thing you have to do is a credible operational plan, then strategy, and then see how much you need in terms of forces. Uh, the discussion lately has been on a very distributed model, linked together by inter inter uninterrupted communication, mm -hmm. and being able to, and stealth, and be able to move and supply those forces. Uh, so I think the traditional sort of notion of just, it's the number of people you have, that's what, that's what is the key factor, has to be looked at again. Okay, good, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so we don't have a whole lot of time and it's, that's totally my fault, but let me get um, uh, two quick questions maybe at the same time and see if the Senator can indulge us right here, sir. Thank you for joining the Senator. My name is Jack Hanley. I'm one of the uh, Aspen Strategy Group rising leaders. Um, and I wanted to drill down a little bit more on your question. You just have to keep it a little bit short. Because sorry, sorry. Uh, defense acquisition um, obviously takes a long time. And in the US Navy, we'd call there might be a zero defect culture of a fear to fail at the risk of the perception of wasting US taxpayer dollars mm -hmm. and how that perhaps holds us back from fielding those prototypes and technologies and getting them into the warfighter's hands sooner. How do we overcome that, whether it's with your colleagues in the Senate, sir, or, uh, or more broadly in the defense enterprise? Thank you. Yeah. And if you, yeah, all right, let's get one more in the, sir, yeah. Better read Michael Brown, Defense Perfect. Innovation Unit. Perfect. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm interested in your view on the difference in philosophy between authorizers and appropriators. You're both. It seems that the authorizers are much more willing to lean into, let's have speed and agility be part of the budgeting process. Appropriators, less so. So I think that's key to making sure that ideas that we have on the authorizing side actually get funded. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, my thought is uh, that uh, appropriate is, uh, well, let me put it the other way. Authorizers, I think, would be much more comfortable by giving more discretion to the acquisition authorities in terms of the amount of money they can deploy without all the elaborates. The appropriators, and I am guilty of being an appropriator, are much less concerned because they see their role as to the taxpayers making sure every nickel is spent. I think we have, there is a room to grow that flexibility and will help the development. And then what gets to your point, which is right on target, uh, the fear to fail is one of the most significant inhibiting factors. So we have to build within DOD this culture of it's okay to fail uh, as long as we learn something from it. So the evaluation is not, did you, you know, cross the finish line? It's like, what have we learned, and we can, can we use that? And right now, I don't think that's the culture, but that's something we have to build. Okay. I think the music is about to begin, so uh, I think that's it for us today. Yeah, I think we've got can a we have one more? Can we, <laughs> can we do one quick? All right, I'm going to go for it, sir. Sorry, you got one before, so I just wanted to get to some other people. Sir, real quick. Hi, Senator. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sam Dorman with Fox Digital. And um, I just want to ask you really quick, Senator Hawley recently introduced an amendment that's directly challenging your, um, your uh, I guess, th the proposal that you had for the uh, appropriations package to basically, um, you know, change who can be in the draft and require women to be in the draft. Um, so I was wondering if you could just respond to that. He's saying, you know, it's a crazy proposal. Uh, the, the, the commission of, on selective service and volunteer service was uh, commissioned. It did an extraordinarily good job, very thorough, several years. Senator McCain and I were both the co-sponsors. It recommended the, uh, uh, that females should register as well as males. My, my view is that uh, we have a force now that would not be as effective as efficient without women. And uh, I don't think there's a, most women feel that, that they, they shouldn't register. I think they should. I, I think many of my, I look around my female colleagues, the combat veterans, uh, wounded in action, et cetera. Uh, and the other factor I would say is, uh, as we look at the future, uh, you know, uh, we're gonna need a lot more people who can operate autonomous vehicles, et cetera. You don't have to be six feet two et cetera, to do that and be able to bench press 280 pounds. You just gotta be smart and well-educated and willing to serve the nation. So all those counts. 
and, and you know, they, uh, uh, I'm exactly uh, at five and a half feet tall. I just made it into West Point. So, and uh, nowadays, I think it's a, they're much more open to, to, to people of smaller size, but a passionate intensity. So, uh, maybe, I think the women should be in the draft. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay.